Yeah, well, I was at Upper Canada College at the time, and I was planning to go into the Royal Navy in peacetime, because I was very interested in the Navy. And uh, then the war broke out, so I went down to HMCS York, and I asked them, uh, I told them I wanted to join up. Uh, and they said, well, don't be ridiculous, there's 22,000 people on the waiting list right now. So I went back, and they said, go back to school and finish your school. So I went back to school. Two weeks later, they called me back up again and said, by the way, we are starting a special naval training division at the University of Toronto uh, for six months, or not six months, yeah, six months, I guess. And uh, we'd like to know if you'd like to join up, because it's going to be in connection with some secret work we're doing. So that sounds real pizzazzy, you know. So I, I joined up, and uh, that's turned out to be joining up to be Aztec. Well, Aztec is an anti submarine Aztec stands for the Anti-Submarine Detection and Investigation Committee that was formed in Britain after World War I to determine more effective ways of hunting submarines. And by the time the World War II broke out, they had some device uh, working, and uh, that's what they put on the ships. They weren't perfect, but they were a start. And as the war went on, they got more and more sophisticated. And today, I guess they're very, very sophisticated. But in those days, they were simply uh, an electronic device that hung from the bottom of the ship that sent out a sound signal, which went ping, and it would go for 2,500 yards. And of course, it was it was on a a device that turned, eh? 360 degrees. And so you could, if you wanted to call it, you could sweep anywhere you wanted by, by simply sweeping the machine around. And then if it hit something, it went whoop. So if you were going along with a ship and steaming along and all of a sudden you had ping whoop, you started to find out, you know, two of the two sides of it. And if it was like a 10 degree whooping, in other words, it went ping, whoop, ping, whoop, it was 10 degrees in between, and either was a whale or a sub, so then you had to figure out whether which it was, and try and not alarm the whole ship by getting them to action stations to attack a sub, but at any rate, there were ways you could basically distinguish the whale from the, the sub, so that's what you did, and several times in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, when I was working uh, on, on duty, I sent out the pings and got the whoop back, and away we went after the sub. Uh, but three times when we, the convoy was attacked by submarines, the ships on the inboard side of us were hit, and all of it, hell broke loose in the sense there was a terrible explosion, and everybody was running around like mad, and we were going to action stations. and. Uh, the, the first time it happened, the captain yelled to the merchant ship alongside, what's the matter, George, what happened? He said, I hit a mine. I was lying on the floor because the explosion had knocked me right off my anti-submarine seat. I was lying on the deck, and I, I didn't want the captain to think it was a, a mine because I heard this, the torpedo go underneath the boat, underneath the ship, and it sounds like a subway train. <laughs> And finally I told him it's no mine, it's a torpedo went underneath the ship, and three times the torpedoes went underneath our ship. I heard them go under, you know, because we drew 22 feet and the merchant drew 44 feet, you see, and the subs set their torpedoes, generally speaking, unless they wanted to hit us, then they deliberately set them for maybe 15 feet. You know, well, for, no, I was on the Atlantic run. The, uh, Newfoundland to London area. I made a couple of runs on that and then went to the St. Lawrence. Then I also went, a lot of people don't realize this, but when the Americans came to the war, they'd sent all their ships to the Pacific. And the sinkings of the tankers and, and, and merchant ships off the American coast was just astronomical. 600 and a bang, you know. And Winston Churchill was so alarmed at the sinkings, he said, if this keeps up, we're finished. So he told Roosevelt, we've got to do something about it. So uh, uh, meantime, Mackenzie King was at that conference, and he said, well, maybe we can do something about it. So the Canadian Navy took over running the convoys into New York, Boston, and Newport to protect the American ships. And the only ships the Americans really had to lend to do that kind of work were airships. 
and they used to come floating in over the convoy in the dawn and say, here we are, the U.S. Navy blimp number so-and-so, we're going to patrol over, over around the convoy, and of course they could see a sub, oh, well. they could see a sub down in the water, you know, if it was, unless it was really deep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but one time the blimp came over and uh, it came over and said, good morning Canada, here we are, we're here to help you uh, fight the submarines and so forth. And he said, you lucky guys, I understand you have booze aboard, because the American Navy didn't have, didn't allow booze, eh? So our captain, who was a real character, said, well, if you want some booze, come and get it. So the American blimps came over the mast of the corvette and, and, and stalled sort of over there. They sent down a bucket and C Captain Skinner put a couple of bottles of booze in it and sent it up. And the blimp went off in the distance flashing back, thank God for Canada and the, uh, the Canadian Navy. <laughs> for God bless Canada and the Canadian Navy, that was it, yeah. Oh yeah, well that, uh, that John boy, I was on duty at that particular night and uh, I think if, this, if I got the right one, I think I have. I was sitting in my Aztec cabin and looking out, and I saw the lighthouse on the shoreline. And I thought, my gosh, if, if Germans were trying to sink a ship, and I saw the merchant ship start to cut the light, I said, boy, what a perfect target. All you have to do is sit out there and wait till a ship crosses the lighthouse light, and bingo, you fire your torpedoes. At that point, seconds later, there was <laughs> boom, crash, and that's the one I was started telling you about before. And uh, so uh, we, uh, Captain Skinner, immediately, we knew that the torpedoes had come in when, he, when I finally told them that there were torpedoes, but we knew the torpedoes had come in from our uh, port side, so, and we knew roughly the angle, so we swung into that angle and tore up the, the so-called track of the torpedo, or the alleged, or whatever, or the track we thought was on the torpedo, and when we got to roughly where we thought the U-boat was, we dropped depth charges. Now, in that particular attack, as I recall it, I don't think I was able to get a contact with the submarine. But at any rate, uh, we did all that, and then we came, but Skinner being an ex-Merchant Navy guy, uh, a Merchant Navy guy who'd be Went into the was called into the navy during wartime. You see, he was always very conscious of the merchant people. So he turned around after hunting around and dropping maybe 40 depth charges all over the place. Came back alongside the sinking ship. And we began to pull the survivors out of the water. And they were all a lot of them were very badly burnt. And I remember, and we, what we were doing was we're pulling them out of the water and taking them aboard the ship and starting to treat their burns. And you tear off all the oil and wet clothing. And then we had a tannic powder we could pour on them to just temporarily help their burns and until we got them to port where the proper medical authorities could take over. Uh, one, and one guy I was treating, he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a little clipping of a RAF pilot and a little writing underneath it It said, Johnny Walker, a famous RAF ace. And this guy said to me, you know, that's my son. And I said, oh, I thought, very interesting. But I started, here's this mud, this oily, grub-stricken guy, and his son's a famous RAF ace. Uh, I'll, I'll believe it. But at any rate, uh, we went on, we treated them, and then we uh, went to take up our position in the convoy. And I'd left the Aztecs, I'd, I'd left rather treating the merchantmen, and gone down below in the forecastle where our quarters were, and there was a terrible explosion. I thought, oh my God, we've been hit. And I rushed up on deck, and everybody on deck was wondering what on earth that was, and nobody seemed to know, and the only, only person that seemed to know anything was one chap said, I saw a flash on the horizon. Meantime, Skinner thought, really didn't know what it was, but he thought somebody may be dropping a whole mass of bunch of depth charges or something, so we went out in the general area where the raccoon was supposed to be screening the convoy, and we couldn't find her anywhere. And uh, we began to get worried, and you can't sort of get on the radio and say, hey, where are you, raccoon, because you can't break radio silence. But Skinner was so worried, he wirelessed eventually to port, saying, there's something crazy going on. Uh, 
not crazy, but something weird, strange going on. The raccoon, I can't find the raccoon. And uh, at any rate, to make a long story short, what turned out, that submarine, that uh, torpedo, one I was talking about, torpedo the merchant ship, apparently torpedoed the raccoon and hit her in the magazine, which was like you know, a, a massive explosion. And the only thing they finally found of the raccoon was one guy's body washed up on Anticoste Island. And I guess the rest of it were little pieces, you know. But that was kind of sad. And it was kind of sad, too, because I was taking out the, the, the sister of one of the guys on the raccoon in Sydney, Nova Scotia, where, where the raccoon was based. And when I came back in, I had a feeling that something wrong was wrong with the raccoon, but I had a date to take her out that night, go, go down to the park where there were canoes and all sorts of things, just something to get away from, you know, the Navy. And she kept saying, why is my brother in port, you know, because he's with your group. And I said, well, I don't know, she probably went somewhere else. But I, I was glad to get out of there and not have to discuss it with her, because her family probably found out the next day. It's doing really, really hard. But, uh, you know, that was kind of sad. Well, yes, you had both responsibility, but you sure got the gears from the other guys if you you, you attack whales and things, and you got with them all to action stations in the middle of the night. And the only thing I think our skipper was pretty good. He he would after sort of going after one of these things that we sort of thought, thought might have been a sub. He would say, "Well, we'll drop a few depth charges and get you off the hook, <laughs> so that we could stop ring all clear. The guys can go back to sleep, and you know, you know you've done your duty. You've." helped us try and attack a sub sort of thing, you know. But uh, Uncle Eve was quite a character. I mean, he was like a father to all of us. Yes, it, actually, yes, he was a rum runner, uh, and in the World War I, he was in a Newfoundland regiment overseas, and he got captured by the Germans. And while he was being, uh, w working in a farmer's field with a German guard beside him, I don't know what he was he planting wheat or whatever he was doing, he uh, finally took his pitchfork and drove it through the German's chest and escaped. And he used to say during our activities, if we catch the Germans, we kill them, we kill them. We don't shoot them, we kill them. Because he had that terrible memory, you know, of being very badly treated in, as a prisoner of war in Germany. But, uh, but he, we called him Uncle Eve because he had this Newfoundland accent and he'd come up on the bridge and look around and he'd say, if we see any German U-boats tonight, we kill them. Or uh, if the moon come up, it's going to make it awfully bad if that moon come up. Yes, if, if that moon come up, it's going to be brightening everything up and it's going to be bad for the convoy. And, you know, if, if I do this and if I do that. And so we call him Uncle Eve. But he was, he was like a father to all the guys. And, and, and there are lots of guys who are old enough to be our fathers, you know. But they all, they all admired him too. Uh, I was thought we, we were taking a very big convoy up the coast, and uh, we had, oh, I think four or five corvettes escorting it. And I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure why the Salisbury destroyer, British destroyer, was over there, over in Canadian waters, but for whatever reason she was, and she came out to uh, join the convoy, and we for proceeding up the coast past Gas Bay, and I was pinging away, and I got a ping whoop, and I and there's three things you say if you say contact. That means to an officer on the bridge that he must attack that echo. The the Aztec merchant has that uh, sort of prerogative. Then you can say contact uh, something else, and then there's disregard. At any rate, he told me to disregard. Well, I was so sure I had a contact that I did, I, I did something I, you should never do. I disobeyed him, and I kept pinging off, pinging off, pinging off. I was going down this sort of the one side of the convoy, and all of a sudden I heard guns going off, torpedo, I mean, like ships blowing up and all this sort of thing. Then they rushed into the Aztec hut, and they said, Quick, screen down the stern to such and such, such degrees. See if you pick up a U-boat. I said, that's the U-boat I got. It's down there. Well, so we went into attack. Well, that's when I ran into the 
the problem with the pill and wafer. So we had a perfect contact. And we ping, whoop, ping, whoop, ping, whoop. And as you're getting closer and closer, you get to what they call instantaneous echoes. That means you're right over the sub and there's no whoop. It's just ping, 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 ping. And we were, we were doing ping, whoop, ping, whoop, ping, whoop, which meant you're getting very, very close. And all of a sudden, nothing disappears. And of course, the captain's tearing his hair out. You're trying to figure out what the heck's gone wrong. And you just can't figure out what's gone wrong. So meantime, you go in and attack anyway and drop your depth charges. And you try and try come back at the point again. And by this time, you, you, you can't find him at all. The reason being, he's gone down to about 500 feet lying on the bottom. And we never knew that U-boats could, at that point, point in time, could go that deep. But at any rate, that's where he was hiding. But at any rate, when I went, when I was chosen to be an officer, cadet, and I was in Halifax, going before the selection board, I was one of the first two guys to go before the selection board because I had to go and rejoin my ship, which was up in Quebec City, supposedly on the way to the Mediterranean. And so I went in there. And there's a story before this story, I'll just encapsulate it. I had been taken off my ship as being deathly ill and been in hospital for 30 days. And, and I, when I rejoined the ship, ship well, at least I was sent to Halifax fax, to rejoin the ship, but the ship wasn't in Halifax. But I was in, in, in survivor's clothing. I had a nice jacket, pants, shirt and tie because when I came out of the hospital in Sydney and reported to the Sydney base there, they said, your ship's been sunk. That's a story, he says, when Lord Ha Ha says you're sunk, you're really sunk. So eventually he sent me to Halifax and I was still in my civilian clothes. When suddenly I went to visit people I knew in Halifax and they said, oh, your buddy's been here. I said, my buddy's been here, that must mean the ship's in harbor. So I went down and asked if the ship was in Halifax. They said, no, I couldn't figure that one out. So I went up to the place the next night, my civvies, and again, my buddy had been there and left. They, they said he was all gussing up his uniform, and the penny dropped. I said, I'll bet you he's down here for a selection board. So I went into the main barracks in, Hal in Halifax, all dressed up as a civilian, and I said, my name is, I'm leading seaman, or able seaman Jeffrey Smith, and the guy said, yeah, you look like it. Uh, I said, by any chance, is there a selection board? He said, what the hell would you be doing in a selection board? I said, well, never mind being smart, take a look. He said, yeah, there's a selection board tomorrow morning at 9.30. I said, see if my name's on it, Jeffrey Smith. He said, oh, by God, your name's on it. He said, well, well, you can't go before the selection board looking like that. I said, I'm glad you figured that one out. So they quickly rushed me down this place to get uniform and everything else, and you have to sort of fix your uniform up a bit. So I went up to these friends' place in Halifax and you know, sunk, set, put my cap in salt water for the, to make it look salty and put seven creases in my pants, which is meaning the seven seas. And I went before the selection board, but I, I was coming in. And I was so I had brand new boots on. When I came to attention, I fell flat on my face, and I said, "Oh my gosh, that's it! No, I'll never be. Not only will I not be commissioned, I may be thrown out of the navy." Anyway, I got up on my feet, and uh, some guy just just as they were starting to question me again, some guy said, "By any chance, were, were you on the Arrowhead?" And I said, "Yes." Were you the guy that attacked the sub? I said, yes, I was. They said, well, did you did you experience the pill and wafer? I said, what's the pill and wafer? And they said, well, the pill and wafer is a large aspirin-like tablet that the U-boats drop to make a bubble screen in front of them. And when you attack them, you suddenly lose contact with them. I said, well, that's exactly what happened to me. So the rest of the admirals and all that thing around the table all sort of got into this story. You see, and he, well, tell me this and tell me that. And I was telling them in typical naval jargon, you know, like uh, like this sea and like that sea, you know. And suddenly some guy said, listen, we've got 148 more guys to interview. We better get rid of this character. So I was dismissed. But because I told them the salty story of attacking the sub and everything else, uh, somehow or other I was one of the 150 that was commissioned, went to King's College.